Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, please turn with me in the word of God to Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9. You, you can also find our passage there on page 13 in your liturgy. And once again here we are joining our Lord Jesus Christ and he is with only three of his closest apostles. You recall last week we heard from uh, the Savior difficult words. It was as if Jesus was saying to his followers, no cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. We heard that we were to take up our crosses and follow him. And, and as we bear our crosses and follow Jesus, it's not that the Christian life is unbearable. Uh, it can be joyful. Because as we heard, we do so in rich communion uh, with Christ. But of course, even with our communion with Christ, as we bear our crosses um, through trials and hardship, even with Christ at our side, at times life can seem unbearable at times, can't it? And Jesus knows that. And so here in our passage, Jesus knowing the great challenges on the horizon for his disciples and for us, Jesus is going to take a bit of a hiatus here. And he takes uh, Peter, James, and John and us on what I like to call a heavenly hike. A heavenly hike to behold his glory. The apostles need to glimpse the glory of Christ and you and I need to glimpse the glory of Christ today as well. And the reason is because we see here our Savior's transfiguration. What we see here is the curtain is going to be pulled back on, on our ultimate destiny, on the glory that's to be revealed to us in Christ and even in us who are in Christ. And this is a great mountaintop experience. And my hope is that as you behold the glory of Christ, Christ would capture uh, your hearts yet again. And so we're going to consider our passage in three points. First, we want to see uh, the disciples' eyes. We want to see the glory that they see. Secondly, we're going to consider the disciples' ears, the glory that the disciples hear. And then finally, we'll consider the disciples' hearts, the glory that must capture our hearts. And so let us seek uh, the Lord's blessing upon the reading and preaching of his word together. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, you, you've told us through your Son that no one can serve two masters. We will hate one and love the other. And we thank you that we come to you. You are not a cruel master. You are a loving master and Lord and God. And help us, we pray, to receive your love, to receive this word of revelation as it's read, that, as it's proclaimed that you would illumine our hearts, that you would soften our hearts, that you would enlarge them with the hope of glory that is ours in Christ. O oh Lord, be glorified in the midst of us, your needy people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mark uh, chapter nine, reading verses one through 13. Hear the words of the living God. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. And after six days, Jesus took with them Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they, saw, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People of God, there are some 
standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. And you might hear verse 1 and be thinking, well, Jesus, what about your first words in the Gospel of Mark? Those first words you preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. Which one is it? Is the kingdom of heaven at hand? Is it seen now? Or are we going to need to wait for it? Are we going to need to wait six days? Well, I think... The thing about the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Always at hand. Always on the scene. Always at work. And when you think of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, the best way to understand it, it's synonymous with the new creation. You read kingdom of God. I challenge you. Challenge you. I encourage you. (laughs) Read the gospels. Hang on to those kingdom of God words, kingdom of heaven words. And realize what those mean is the king is on the scene and his kingdom is on the scene. Not in the Revelation 22 cents, 21 cents. But inaugurated, it's begun. You might think, well, Pastor, great. How, though? Can you flesh that out for me? Well, the kingdom of heaven is at hand through Christ's words and his works. Christ's words are life-giving. What what do his words do? Tell you your sins are forgiven. Christ's words turn stony hearts of spiritual death into spiritual life and peace with God. You think of Christ's works. The lame are healed. The blind receive their sight. The broken are made well. The demon possessed are delivered. Christ does great works of healing. God, through Christ by the Spirit, is bringing about the new creation on the scene. Kingdom of heaven, not just in his person, but in his works, undoing the corrupt effects of sin and the fall. I like to think of it, I was in Ukraine 15 years ago uh, to the summer, spent the better part of a summer doing some missionary work and we were based out of the city of Kherson. Um, throughout the week we'd go out to these orphanages, live with the kids, love the kids. I was the only uh, Presbyterian. I went with a bunch of Pentecostals. It was great people. We had such unity in Christ for the most part. They'd translate, you know, my sermons and we'd talk about tongues and everything else. It was an amazing experience, okay? And some nights though in Ukraine, whether we're sleeping in the orphanages or back at church, there were these amazing lightning storms. Boom, the thunder would rattle the walls of these rickety orphanages. thought they were going to fall down. Lightning's like right above us. Bang. And when you think of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, whenever Christ's words or his works go forth, it's like a lightning blast. New creation. Life from the dead, new creation, restoration, you're healed. It's a fruit of the new creation. Life, life through his words, through his works. The kingdom of God is on the scene. We get a foretaste of that as you read through the Gospels. And yet Jesus says here in verse 1, some are going to see the kingdom before they die. Notice what the disciples see there in verse 2. Look there. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain. Now, there's lots of debate over which mountain this is. Is it, is it Mount Tabor? Is it Mount Hermon? You know, much of the debate misses the point of the significance of mountains in Holy Scripture. Mountains in Holy Scripture are meeting places of God with his people. They're places of God's particular closeness with his people. You think about Adam and Eve in the garden. You know the Garden of Eden. What did it have flowing out of it? Four rivers. Rivers, do they flow uphill? Probably pretty rare, if ever. It was a mountain. An axis mundi, a meeting place of God with humanity. Of course, Moses and the elders in the Old Covenant, they went up Sinai. What'd they do? They ate and drank with God. There's various mountains in Jesus' life, the mountain of his temptation, the Sermon of the Mount, the mountain of his great preaching, the mountain of his prayer, where he, he, he goes away to, to pray and to commune with the Father. Think of the Mountain of Olives, that, that scene of that great agony there in the garden, and of course, Mount Golgotha, the cross, where our Lord was lifted up to draw all people unto himself. 
And then there to conclude the gospels, that mountain in Galilee where the resurrected Christ told his apostles to meet with him. And he gave them the great commission. That's why we're here. They obeyed it. They first heard it on that mountain. Mountains have a significant place to play today, though, in the lives of God's people as well. There is this great event. I mentioned some great events in redemptive history, didn't I? Lots of them. Read through your Bible, you'll see even more. There's a great event in redemptive history that takes place every seven days. It takes place every seven days at a mountain until Christ returns. Each Lord's Day, as God gathers us to worship, what does he do? He summons us up to his throne. You heard it in our call to worship. As God's people, we gather at the mountain, Mount Zion. God lifts you up. Maybe your weary bones, <laughs> sin, shit, whatever you're carrying in Christ, God lifts you up into the heavenly Jerusalem. Though here we are in North Hills. He lifts you up to the living God and you're with the angels and glorified saints. Each week your gracious and loving God lifts you up and he comes in mercy and peace to gather you to himself that you might worship him. And so you see mountains in scripture, they're not merely places of outward and physical ascent. <laughs> they're to be places of, of, of spiritual inward ascent and closeness to God. And by way of application, obviously, you, you know I was, Pastor Ron's traveling, we're like ships passing in the night with our vacations in the summer. I go, I come back, he goes. And on our vacations, we go to other churches. And of course, my kids, we heard, my kids always badger me, can we go to our church? Can we go to our church? When are we going to go back to our church? You know, I, I don't know if it's because they, they love the worship service or they love their friends or they just... They like their church. And we heard good preaching, good singing. A lot of churches are very sincere. They're doing things the best they can. I'll tell you what I like most about our church. I want to go to our church all the time. But I want vacation too. What I love most about this church you know, is you fine folk are amazing and wonderful. But what I love most about our church is there's something absolutely divine that takes place here. Each and every week, we see that the, the, the rhythms of redemption are on display. As we come in, God lifts us to himself, doesn't he? He speaks to us. He confronts us in our sin and he doesn't leave us there. He comforts us with the gospel. That your sins are forgiven. And then God encourages you with his word. And then what does he do? He seals his love to you at his table. Each week, we, we ascend the mountain. We are being lifted up by God, greeted by God. There's grace and peace. We are received by God again and again. Each week, dear Christian, you are refreshed and loved again and again. And then God's final word to you, you know what it is? It's not one of cursing before you hit the road. The world's hard enough as it is. He sends you out with his blessing, his name upon you. Grace, love, peace, his face is towards you, his blessings upon you. Go, Christian. Go for the glory of God. He refreshes you because he loves you and because you absolutely need it. And so each week as you come to the mountain, lift up your heart to God. Lift it up. Lift up your soul to God. Lift up your voice to God. And when it comes to singing, you know, I'm at like the bottom of the bell curve. Hideous voice. But you know when we come together and we're all belting it out? God is enthroned on the praises of his people. Enthroned on the praises. And we gather to do these things by what? By faith. And yet here in our passage, the disciples encountered the glory of Christ by sight, don't they? Notice what they see of Jesus here at the end of verse 2. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. It's interesting what the different gospel writers focus on with the transfiguration. Matthew says of Jesus that his face shone like the sun, that his clothes became white as light. Luke says that all this happened while Jesus was praying. Show them 
Uh, you know, you say, basically, it's Christ praying the answer to Moses' prayer. Show them my glory. Moses has to wait thousands of years. God answered his prayer. Keep praying, no matter what you're praying. Maybe it's not that sanctified of a prayer, but keep praying. Keep asking. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. I don't know what it is today. I don't know what it is for years you've been seeking the heart of God according to the will of God and the word of God. Don't lose heart. Some, Moses had to wait a couple thousand years. God is faithful to you, Christian. We know they see Christ in his glory, but why do the disciples see it? Thomas Merton says, they see it for the confirmation of their faith. Christ would give his disciples a glimpse of his glory because he knew they would be sorely assaulted and shaken by the ignominy of his cross. Transfiguration gives these apostles who Christ has called and will commission to preach and give their lives up for the gospel a glimpse of his glory. And here we are given a glimpse of the glory and destiny of our lives. The world will soon reject Jesus. They will reject his followers and with us too. And you know what? We need hope. Because so often we are so very weak and, and sinful. And so often the world and the flesh and the devil are so very fierce. And so we need a glimpse of the king and his glory and and the glory that is Christ, he reveals here. And so, dear Christian, behold the glory of your Savior here with the eyes of faith. Hope in the glory that is to come, the glory uh, that is yours already if you're in Christ. No one hopes for what they see. What do we do? We wait for it with patience. We hopefully and, and, and prayerfully and patiently wait the return of the glory of our Savior. The disciples see this. What a privileged sight. They saw it with their eyes. But notice to our second point, the disciples' ears. Notice the glory that they hear, beloved. Notice verse 4 there. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. But what are the apostles hearing? Have you ever wondered what they were talking about there on that mountain of glory, that transfiguration? Oh, what it would have been like to be a fly on the side of that mountain. Hear that conversation. That sanctified speech. But you know, beloved, we don't have to guess. Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah were speaking with Jesus about his exodus or his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. You think of those words, exodus and departure, it makes the, the cross not sound all that bad, doesn't it? <laughs> it's interesting, they're talking about Christ's death, and when it comes to piece of cake deaths or departures, guess which two are near the top of the list? Moses and Elijah, aren't they? You recall Moses in Exodus, though he's prevented from entering the promised land, the scripture tells us that he died full of vigor and life and was buried by God. You think of piece of cake deaths. Elijah too. Remember when the chariots of fire? Love Jeff Oxman. He, you know, when things would push, come to shove in ministry, he would say, swing low, sweet chariot. I love that about you, Jeff. I should ask your permission to say that. And basically, you know, come deliver us, Lord. Lord, come deliver us. The sweet chariot swings low and Elijah, what is he? He's carried away like a whirlwind to heaven. Piece of cake. Don't, isn't that the kind of departure you want? <laughs> It's not the kind of departure in Exodus Jesus is going to get. Let me tell you. These two are with the Savior. They're not talking about their so-called departures. They're not even talking about uh, the Messiah and the death of God's foes. Instead, they're talking with Jesus about his own death, the death of God's Messiah for sinners. And you see, they're talking about that because the apostles must hear of this yet again because it's so hard for them to receive. And so the sanctified chit-chat between uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and Moses and Elijah. Moses, the law, Elijah, the prophets, is intended, I think, once again, to teach Peter and James and John once again that Jesus is going to die, not by some happenstance, but he's going to die because he is the Christ, the Messiah of God. You see, at this point, the 
Apostles only have expectations for glory. Glory only. And yet God gives them a glimpse of glory to preserve them in their sufferings to come. Dear Christian, great suffering awaits the Savior and his followers here in Mark's gospel. And by way of application, I I would remind you, um, such is the pattern of our lives as well. Suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. It was the pattern of Christ's life. It was the pattern of his apostles' life. It's the pattern of our lives. What do you expect, beloved? Suffering shows that God makes much of us. Remember Job What is man that you make so much of him that you set your heart on him? (laughs) Job says that when he's suffering so greatly. Think of Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, and yet Joseph remained forgotten for two years. Both are equally true. With you as well, Christian. The Lord is with you. He has not forgotten about you. No matter what you're going through, cling to the hope that is yours in Christ, the Lord of glory. Suffering loosens our hearts from the world, doesn't it? You know, I had a tiny palm tree in my yard. It's growing kind of right by where the, the, the water comes from the street into the house. I thought, well, you know, I need to dig that thing up. <laughs> I used a little trowel. That thing was super tiny. And I worked at it for like 20, 30 minutes. And it was a pain to get those palm trees. Those roots are like, no wonder they stand in hurricanes. And then, um, you know, uh, Mindy's husband, Ed, loans me tools from time to time. And I went over to his house a couple of years ago. He had this huge palm tree on the side of his house. He had his shovels out and everything, chains. He had his truck basically reversed up to the lawn. He was going to get that thing out. Roots go deep. And what God does when suffering comes to you, it's like removing a tree from the ground. First you need to, to, to loosen uh, the earth around the roots. And just like that, God digs away our earthly comforts. To loosen our hearts from the world. It is God's desire, beloved, that, that, that our hearts hold to this world only by the smallest root. And they cling to him. It doesn't mean you're going to walk around radiating the glory of Christ. It doesn't mean that people are going to read the glory of Christ off your face. You may be the aroma of death to some. But you need a glimpse of the glory of Christ. Because this age is filled, as we sing, with what? With trials, toils, and tears. It's filled with great glory, too. Don't get me wrong. Praise God for his blessings and his gifts. But it's at those times when you, um, in life, when you feel so very weak. And your sufferings feel so very great. That you must glimpse the glory of Christ. Glorious splendor awaits you, beloved, in the age to come. Complete renewal is yours. You're the future reality, Christian. We heard of it earlier in Revelation. It's glorious. I think one of the beautiful things about Moses and Elijah here is we get to see uh, in these two how blessed we will be in the resurrection. (laughs) You know, throughout the generations, God has saved a multitude of people, and he will continue to do so. The church is the one body of Christ that's filled with people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language and people group. And yet we all have this common inheritance in Christ. We get a glimpse of that with with Moses and Elijah in the courts above and Peter and James and John in the courts below. What what, What unites in Christ and his glory? And so I say by way of application for those of you who've lost loved ones in the Lord, people always say it gets easier. Some days and some days not at all. It's so painfully hard. But for those of you who've lost loved ones in the Lord or you're facing uh, the prospect of your own death, what we're shown in in this transfiguration is is you get Jesus (laughs) and everyone else. And it's such a great image of our new humanity in Christ, that great uh, consummation that awaits all those who believe. And of course, you know, our dear friend Peter, right? He's, he's headed for another rough week, isn't he? <laughs> he wants to enjoy the moment. 
He wants to keep the mountaintop experience going. I mean, you can't blame him. He doesn't know what to say, but he still shoots a shot, doesn't he? And you notice what happens when he shoots a shot. The, father, the father's words are what the disciples hear. The cloud overshadowed them. Look there in Mark's gospel. And the voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Notice what the apostles hear. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The great theologian, my favorite living theologian, Michael Horton likes to say, you know, God speaks to us the same way we speak to our kids sometimes. You know, when it's time for chores or clean up or bedtime, what do we say to our kids? Don't just sit there, do something, right? <laughs> Mike Horton says, you know, God likes to say to us, don't do something, just sit there. <laughs> just sit there, listen, receive, then go. The father is saying, sit there, listen. This is my beloved son. And of course, the beloved son being referred to here means that there is a lover there's an eternal father of love who, who, who sets his love on the beloved son. And, and these are rich theological uh, depths that we can not begin to plumb. But the best expression of Trinitarian theology throughout the church is these thinkers have understood that, that the eternal father, this God of love, the eternal son is, of course, the beloved and the bond of love between the eternal Father and the eternal begotten Son, the bond of love is, of course, that spirit that proceeds, that spirated the love between the Father and the Son. The bond of love is the Holy Spirit from all eternity. So glorious, so beautiful. And that's just these inter-Trinitarian processions. We wouldn't even know it or see it. What do we see? We see the missions. The missions go forth. The Father sends the Son. The Son brings the new creation, life, healing, forgiveness. The Son says, come on, we're going up the mountain. Transfiguration, glory. He's on a mission. He's on a mission to save sinners. Because the Father loves sinners. He loves His Son. His Son loves to save us. And that's what He's doing. And part of your ability to be saved and persevere to the end is you must behold the beloved Son glorified here you must listen to him you must rest in him you must receive him and in doing so what are you receiving God's love for you from the father through the son by the spirit that that lifts your heart to this God of love and grace and salvation the father is so pleased with the son the son comes to love he heals he bears with the apostles he's going to the cross look look where he is though He's in time and space. <laughs> in his love, God sent the Son in flesh in time and space. Apostle John says it so beautifully. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Glory of the only begotten God, full of grace and truth. Peter wants to throw a tabernacle over Jesus here. He wants to cover up his glory. The Son is already tabernacled, veiled in human flesh, the Godhead. See, listen to him is the Father's command. And by way of application, listen to him, Christian. Listen to him. Listen to what Jesus says about himself. Listen to what Jesus says about you in his word. Listen to what Jesus says in his word about the world. Listen to what Jesus says in his word about your callings at work, in the family. Listen to what Jesus says about giving the good, living the good life. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. So I must ask you, are you satisfied in Christ? Is Christ enough for you? It's a great question because what did Jesus actually bring? We look around, we don't see world peace, do we? We don't see universal prosperity. We don't see a, this amazing world, though it is amazing. What did Jesus bring? 
He brought God. He brought God and now we see his face. Now we can call upon him. Now we can listen to him. Christ is the path that we take in this world and it's a path of suffering and glory. Given a picture of Christ's glory in here. And it's only because of the hardness of our hearts that we think this is too little. (laughs) You know, the transfiguration here is big, isn't it? It's impossible to miss. But God's power at work in and through your life is so imperceptible, isn't it? It seems so small. But his new creation work is the presence and power of God's kingdom. And again and again, God's kingdom appear to be in the death throes in this world, very weak in this age. And yet over and over again, at the very end of history, it's going to be God's kingdom and God's church and you, his precious people, who prove to be the only thing that endures to the very end and is saved. And so the question has come, has this beloved son captured your heart? Has the glory of Christ captured your heart? It's impossible for glory not to capture your heart. The question is, which glory is it? Notice the disciples' hearts here. They're coming down the mountain and Jesus gives them a bit of a gag order, doesn't he? Don't speak to any of this until, um, don't tell anyone until I've risen from the dead. And the disciples have an interesting question there in verse 11. Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? It's a great question. You know, that was actually the last verse of the Old Testament. Elijah's going to come before the great day of the Lord. It's a great question. When Jesus, they're listening with bated breath. And Christ is preparing them. Look what he says in verses 12 and 13. He wants their hearts to be captured by the glory of God. Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man? He's like, forget about Elijah. (laughs) Think about me. That he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as is written of him. Elijah, of course, was John the Baptist. You remember, what did it please the world and the rulers of this world to do to John the Baptist? Off with his head. You know, there's so much talk in our age that we're entering or have entered into a post-Christian culture. Now, it's a great opportunity. A lot of talk about this post-Christian culture, about how primarily, you know, you need to make the gospel intelligible to people, uh, maybe culturally relevant who've never heard it before. We, we do need to do that, right? You need to be prepared for that, Christian. But what I think a lot of people are unprepared for is the hostility of this post-Christian world toward Christ and his followers toward the church you see what we should expect in this post-christian world we need only look at the pages of the new testament in the book of acts don't get me wrong i am very optimistic when it comes to the kingdom of god when it comes to the gospel uh, speeding forth throughout the whole earth but the time is now here in this post-christian culture where it's no longer merely convenient to call yourself a christian The time is here more and more where where it will be a great cost to call yourself a Christian and to follow Christ. And that's why verse 12 is so important. A son of man should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. He's saying to his apostles, to his followers, to you and me, I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be ridiculed. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be despised. I will be beaten. I will be tortured. And so will you, basically, to his apostles. Maybe not you and me. But the greatest question they're asking is, what does the resurrection from the dead mean? That's the question. That's what gives you hope in a post-Christian culture. That's what gives you hope in your sufferings, in your trials. What does the resurrection of the dead mean? mean. I close with a great martyr of the church. His name was Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, great follower of Christ. He was actually a disciple of the Apostle John. And, and he's arrested for the sake of Christ. He's led into the Colosseum 
And he's brought before the tribunal and, and the crowd, and he's given the opportunity to go free if he denounces Christ. Now, Polycarp is, is upwards of you know, 80, 90 years old here. He's an old man, so they're showing him a little bit of respect. And the proconsul begs him, consider yourself and have pity on your great age. Reproach Christ and I will release you. Polycarp replies, 86 years I have served him, and he never once wronged me. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? 86 years I have served him. He has never once wronged me. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And of course then he's threatened with what? Beasts and fire and death. They destroy the body. And he says something to the effect, you can threaten me with fire that burns for a season, but I've been delivered from the everlasting flames of God's judgment. Polycarp stands his ground. He doesn't reproach Christ. He doesn't forsake God. And the apostles question, beloved, what is meant by this resurrection from the dead? Absolutely everything is meant by this resurrection from the dead. Christ's glory and your glory are bound up because Christ has been raised from the dead. And so behold Christ in his glory here, Christian. You were made for glory. You were on your way to glory. And so as you live for Christ, continue to find your lives hidden in Christ with God. For when he appears, you will appear with him in glory. And God's people said, amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, how we thank you for our Savior's glory on display. May it capture our hearts yet again that we might follow him, commune with him, and count everything as lost for the sake of knowing Christ and being found in him. We love you, Lord. We pray, come, Lord Jesus. And yet, as you tarry, draw us ever closer to you and the glory that is ours and our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.